to have a, just a brief overview of the different. Um, the watchword, yes. that's on my right here is at a scale of one inch equals 100 feet. For the people uh, who are watching, the concern that the planning board has had, as expressed by at least one of the neighbors, is that the initial entrance point that has been proposed that's on the east side of Susie Terrian's property um, may not be the best one. Uh, we've looked at a number of different options, four in total. We examined those on paper. We looked at them in the field. We evaluated them in terms of a number of factors. Those factors were summarized in a chart that was submitted to the planning board as part of our most recent submittal. Uh, we looked at one at the far western portion of the Wells Road uh, access point. Uh, we looked at another point to the west of the existing driveway. We looked at one at the driveway, and we finally evaluated the access point where we have uh, been proposing it all along. Uh, the, the first three all seem to have a variety of different problems relative to site distance, impact on the surrounding residential properties, glare from headlights, uh, bringing additional traffic through the residential neighborhood that's up in that vicinity, uh, loss of trees in that vicinity. All these were uh, outlined and summarized in the, in the report. Uh, we showed, however, that it was technically possible to bring the road in at these various points. However, in our estimation, after looking at it in the field, uh, it didn't really seem to make sense in terms of the impact it would have, given the fact that there was, it seemed to us at least, a much obviously stronger uh, point. That didn't mean, however, that we were willing to take um, the plan as originally prepared by the plan, uh, prepared by us for the planning board uh, and leave it at that. We heard a lot of comments from Susie Carrion relative to this uh, distance from her house that the new road would uh, be located in. Uh, we heard comments from the planning board, both in the field and at the uh, recent planning board meeting. Uh, the sketch that you see up here is an enlargement uh, of this portion that shows what is going to be proposed, or what is being proposed right now, essentially moving the road back another 15 or 20 feet uh, to uh, ensure that there be a more stable buffer between the edge of the road uh, and the edge of the Terrian property there. Uh, this would also be re reinforced then by berms, by plantings, by fencing, and so forth. Uh, we did visit this on the site, and I think that uh, people now have a fairly good idea of what this would look like. Uh, when we got out of the field, um, we suggested that there would be an earthen berm through here that would be planted with a variety of materials. And I suggested that we would show you some photographs of a similar situation uh, in Baywood Apartments that we did uh, uh, back uh, about 10 years ago. And I'll pass this around. It's a very similar situation where we had a residential property about in the same position as the Tarion home with a new residential development. In this case, it was uh, apartments on the other side of a of a uh, of an open field. We did plant a, uh, a variety of evergreen trees on top of a berm that was four or five feet high. These photographs uh, are taken about 10 years later. Um, top is the entrance way to the development. Uh, these two photographs show the outside or the public face of the berm. The lower photograph shows the view from the individual's home showing the effectiveness of this berm. We have started some discussion uh, with Susie Terry, and I see she's here tonight. Um, I think that we both understand what the situation would, would require in order to provide her the privacy and the screening, and perhaps also some access to the back of the property that could be worked into this uh, overall development scheme. 
So, in summary, uh, we are proposing the easterly access point after looking at all the factors and at the various options. <coughs> Would the board like to open up any sort of discussion as to <coughs> what anyone in particular feels about what they saw on the sidewalk and how they feel about the entranceway that has proposed? Mr. Chairman, uh, as uh, someone who expressed early on concern about uh, all of the traffic going behind uh, Susie Terrian's property, and in particular the issue of the access being sort of squeezed between uh, the Leightons and the Terrian property, uh, and an ongoing concern with the town's uh, public access waiver standards and, and houses sneaking in behind with very little frontage, I was uh, quite concerned about this location. I think the applicant has, uh, to the greatest extent possible, or to a reasonable extent possible, I should say, uh, tried to accommodate those concerns of uh, uh, the abutter. Uh, I think that it was uh, demonstrated during our site walk that the other alternatives uh, were no, uh, no better in terms of site distance, uh, that even in areas where there's undeveloped land, we've received correspondence from those abutters uh, wishing that the road not to be placed uh, in, in some of the alternate locations. Uh, I would only uh, suggest that uh, this be an ongoing dialogue with the uh, uh, developer and the abutter, and that the, abutter can, uh, the developer continue to uh, accommodate the abutter uh, as, uh, as reasonable. Uh, but in terms of uh, access point on Wells Road, uh, unless other, other circumstances prove uh, differently, I, I would now favor the, uh, the developer's proposal based on the uh, proposed uh, buffer and the relocation of the road away from the Tarian property. <coughs> Thank you. Anyone else have anything they would like to add? Mr. Chair? Mr. Carlson? Yes, um, I somewhat agree also with that. They're looking at the other three possibilities, we're almost thinking about a third lane for a turn-in lane and a, another lane for a, to pick up when you exit the development. Uh, quite a bit of construction on the road in an area where the site is not sufficient. So I think the only possibility, the only thing that comes out of it is that first exit. And again, I also hope that the developer and the abutter will work very closely together. I think the developer, the applicant, has worked very hard so far to uh, alleviate any discomfort that might be on that abutter. And I hope uh, there will be continued review to for even further improve that as the construction goes on. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Wilcox? Chair. Uh, uh, I, too, would like to say that I think from the beginning I had some doubts as to the safety of the westerly approaches into the site and especially now being shown a photograph of what has been represented to us as a degree of buffering possible on this project that if uh, if there's a follow-through with buffering plans uh, which show that that entrance could be treated in that type of fashion as we've just seen that uh, I think that it will uh, make that easterly entrance the best of the possible choices. Thank you. <coughs> Ms. McKay? I guess I would have to add my uh, comments basically along the same lines. I was quite concerned as we started the project about the um, impact on the abutter, uh, but the site walk demonstrated to me that um, especially with respect to sight lines, that they're just, the sight distance, that there just really is not another feasible alternative that is as good as the uh, easternmost uh, access way. I would be, again, echoing the other comments that I really do hope that the developer will do as much as possible to alleviate the impact on the abutter, and I was quite cheered to see the, um, the photographs today. <clears throat> Thank you. I might add that Susie Terry has not seen those photographs. I would very much like to have her take a look at those as part of our ongoing discussion. <clears throat> well, feel free to come up and get them 
pass them along. <clears throat> Mr. Emery? Uh, I believe that the, uh, the, the issue at hand is location of the access. Uh, when we get to phasing, I think the issue of uh, when other access into the site is phased and how much construction uh, mm -hmm. traffic is allowed over this particular access, I think, is worthy of further discussion. Because in addition to the proximity of the homeowners uh, as an ongoing traffic situation is a, a great concern to the abutter is the ongoing truck traffic and uh, material access traffic. Just as a, I guess, a final comment, the the, the brunt of the um, <clears throat> traffic, especially the construction traffic, is going to be going in that entranceway as proposed that we looked at the easternmost entrance. However, I think once the project is built, I think traffic patterns will develop, and I think the other entranceway um, will probably take the lion's share of the morning traffic and the evening traffic, maybe not the weekend traffic, but I still think the other the other end is going to be the fastest way into town for most people. So that might be some sort of mitigating um, consolation for Mrs. Tarion. Okay. Um, next um, item is the community impact statement. And I'll be very honest, I only read parts of it. Uh, I could sort of get bogged down in, um, in numbers and stuff. Um, but does anyone else from the board have something uh, to add? Mr. Mr. Chairman, I think it would be helpful for the board uh, to have this put into context again so we don't lose the forest for the trees. If the planner could give us some direction with respect to, if I were to review this report and find out that we were going to have 100 more uh, classrooms, uh, what is it that the uh, board is, uh, should focus on in terms of community impact and uh, uh, what, what uh, issues can we relay to the uh, applicant with respect to community impacts? Uh, the, the subdivision ordinance submission requirements require that an applicant submit a community impact statement for the planning board to review and that it have several different parts to it, including traffic, roads, uh, solid waste disposal, and impact on the school system that is basically the number of children that will be generated by the development. Uh, once you get the information, though, it, the, the question then becomes, what do you do with it? And in the ordinance, there is supposed to be a very clear link <coughs> between information that's required to be submitted and standards that you use to judge that information and determine whether or not a project meets those standards. Um, there are portions of the community impact statement which directly relate to what to the standards in the ordinance and one of those examples are, are traffic impacts uh, another example is solid waste uh, but when it comes to impact on the school system state law says that the town is required to educate all of the children in the school um, all of the children that live in the town uh, there's nothing in our standards <coughs> that say that that you can uh, require the applicant uh, that you could have the size of the project because you found that there are going to be a lot more children generated by this project than, than there's room in the school system. Um, further decisions uh, by the U.S. Supreme Court have basically left many municipalities with very little options um, unless they have instituted their own specialized requirements to deal with impacts. and. For the school system, uh, based on the letter that the planning board received several months ago from the town attorney, unless the town has in place an impact fee type structure to deal with the impact of a development on the school system, there is very little that you can do to um, mitigate the impact on the school system if the community impact statement shows that it will overwhelm the schools at some point. We do not have an impact fee for schools at this time. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> Any comments from the board on the impact statement? <clears throat> Mr. Chair? <clears throat> Mr. Carter. I just have one question. It's not so much on the impact, but it's that's where it appears. On page seven. Uh, there will be approximately 73 homes built before the moderate income and the low income single family houses are built. Is that correct? That's your plan. It won't be until phase four that you will be constructing the, uh, the two attached single family homes? No, that's not correct. On page six on the bottom for phase one, the description talks about one home 
available for moderate income buyers at 150 and two available for low income. So it will be three homes that will be built as part of phase one. Okay, thank you. Um, Steve Vetzel uh, was not able to be here tonight uh, due to other obligations. However, he did speak to me this afternoon, and the one comment he made clear that I should be stating is that he did feel that you had underestimated the number of children that would be generated by this project that would go to the schools. Beyond that, he had no further comments. Has the school department had a chance to review this document? Uh, I do not provide them with a copy of it, but I would assume that, that you had gone over it with them. We have. Yeah. And uh, I think the, to address that concern, we haven't given a number. We've given a range of numbers that all seem to have some basis uh, in reality. He, he felt the range was low. I must say I'm, I'm missing Mr. Edsel tonight since he's been the primary uh, person who has been um, pushing for the impact analysis. I guess I'd also like to say in all fairness to the applicant that I didn't get this package until yesterday, so I've had 24 hours to look at it. I have actually perused the analysis, but I couldn't tell you that I had digested it. Um, my, my certainly, my overall impression was that we were on the low side with respect to the impact on schools, but I don't have access to, or don't have actually, shall we say, a copy of the um, uh, school statement that was done a couple of years ago. Is that a tremendous long document? I noticed that you chose, or the person who prepared this uh, analysis chose certain pages from that document is that that might be one way I guess to get at the uh, reasonableness of the proffered yeah, numbers. The whole document was 25 pages long I believe. Mm. 17 pages, mm. yeah. A lot of it's uh, tables of statistics. <coughs> With whom did uh, the person who prepared the review clear this and with respect to the school system? Are you? Well, you want to answer? Yeah, I met with uh, Connie Goldman, and um, I think we used a number of reports just in general for anticipating <laughs> the number of children. Um, the way we put it together in the report that we gave to you, we started with uh, actual figures from Cape Elizabeth, mm -hmm. which were the most accurate that the school department was able to generate based on bus trips from two new subdivisions, the two most recent subdivisions that are fairly comparable probably to the kinds of housing that will go in here. Um, again, we felt the numbers generated by those two subdivisions were low. Um, we've tried not to anticipate on the low side. Um, so we, we even added a fudge factor of assuming that a number of high school children are not picked up by school buses, that we would add an extra figure in. I think even at that, it came to about 0.7 school-age children per household. We then compared it with numbers in Falmouth, um, a study that had been done on six or seven subdivisions. And um, again, that was some of the information that was included, I think, in the first report that was given you that came out to be about an average of 0.8 children per household, anywhere from 0.6 to 0.9, depending on the subdivision. And they seem to be, again, in a comparable price range. And then we looked at two um, reports of national statistics on what kinds of family sizes are generated in the Northeast in certain um, income levels and house um, values. And at the highest, it came out to be 82 children. And at the lowest, perhaps lower, you know, 70 or 75. 
for this project. For this project, projecting those numbers onto these uh, numbers of houses, projecting those ratios. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, you know, again, we're looking at school age children. There is a certain number, certain percentage of children produced in a housing development that are under six years of age or five years of age that do not fall into that category. Um, but we felt that it gave a pretty good cross-section from any local data that was available up to national statistics and we gave the range as a range of possibilities. And those were the numbers that I talked about to the superintendent when I met with her. Um, again, phasing them over eight years, there's no question that there will be children generated for the school system. But over a period of eight years, I think the highest number we anticipated from any one year was 13, and the lowest was maybe seven or nine. Um, but again, they're, they're statistical averages. Mm. I mean, you could, have, you could end up with only five in one phase and 16 in another, depending on the families that come in. But based on all of the averages that were out there, um, we feel that the range of, of children in the highest being in the low 80s was fairly well substantiated. It's also a, a, not a very homogenous development. We have different <coughs> types of housing, different lot size, different income levels. I think it's fair to use the Falmouth example where we, where we took a number of different examples and they ranged from the high of uh, almost one child per household down to a low of 0.5. That's quite a spread, but averaging them out, you know, you come to that 0 0.75, 0 0.8, which is the, the number that we're using here. Thank now, you. This, this is school-aged children. This is not total number of children. So we feel that we're you know, reasonably comfortable with these numbers. Same I, I would add that when I ran those by Connie, she did not, you know, she said, she is not a statistician. She does not have any claim to the basis of generating those numbers. She was simply looking at the impact of those children on the school system. So. And her response in terms of impact was? There will be an impact, but is it manageable? Probably. It's, there are so many variables that um, <coughs> I think nobody would go out on a limb and say there will be no impact because there will be an impact, but I think it's incremental in such a way that um, it's probably within the growth that was expected in the schools, which is not to diminish the fact that we know the high school is full. Um, we know that there are some classes that are 25, 26 students if you'd like to be 22. But I think that's a problem that exists now. And you have numbers, for instance, in the eighth grade that will be going into high school that are gonna make your high school numbers even greater next year. But those are problems um, that exist within the system, or not problems, I mean, they're just issues. I think every school system deals with them with bulges, with the ebb and flow of enrollments that each year, each building has to accommodate and make changes and adjustments to. But I think we felt that the numbers phased over eight years didn't distort the projected growth to any measurable degree. They were probably within um, a normal expectation of growth, knowing that the town will grow. Thank you. <coughs> Any other comments from the board on the impact statement? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm wondering if it's appropriate to acknowledge receipt of the uh, uh, report this evening. Um, and in light <coughs> of the uh, brief time that we had to re each had to review it, that it would not be appropriate to a uh, table detailed discussion of the report until the next meeting and particularly in interest of uh, Mr. Parkhurst uh, since the application has been deemed complete for preliminary review and we're continuing to do preliminary review I don't know that it creates a, a hardship to the applicant uh, to do so no, I think it would be make perfect sense for us to all have a chance to read I've read 19 out of the uh, however many pages there are in this and there's a lot there and I think we need some more time to review it and discuss it at a later meeting. Um, and plus we'll have more planning board members here hopefully at the next meeting, which adds, adds something to the discussion. And, and, and I'd like to add with that suggestion that I didn't uh, 
in giving this a cursory view, did not find any smoking guns. Uh, you know, that uh, there wasn't the issue of 25 classrooms and uh, four new plow trucks and all the rest of those issues that uh, generally are concerned with a report like this. Mr. Wilcox? Uh, one, one thing I was wondering, and perhaps uh, the applicant can uh, shed a little more light on this, is uh, in looking at types of housing which uh, are described in the impact study as being a substantial portion of trade-up type dwelling units, uh, uh, a price range that is stated similar to other subdivisions in town other than Stonegate and uh, over on the other side of the marsh there, uh, given the fact that the price range of a lot of housing that's projected for this development is similar to what is on the market now and turning over in Broad Cove and Shore Acres, uh, were there any statistics looked at in terms of the student population of people who trade up for housing into those existing subdivisions? <coughs> no, yeah. Did you look no. at existing subdivisions? Only the ones that were talked about Only in the Stone Gates was in okay. farms. Uh, I, w I would be, uh, I mean, just, just in terms of being something that is representative of trade-up housing in the town of Cape Elizabeth, which seems to be uh, a target market for the, uh, for the subdivision, I'd be interested in just seeing comparatively how that stacks up. One thing that uh, I did notice is in the statistics that you presented from various studies and various subdivisions, there seems to be a little bit of a leaning and a little bit of a weighting toward trade-up housing as opposed to uh, first house type of subdivisions <coughs> that shifts toward the more students per dwelling unit in that area. Uh, so in terms of uh, what we have right now that we're, we're dealing with on an ongoing basis as dwelling units are bought in the town, it would be interesting to know. We don't have the information right now. We can certainly try and provide that. Uh, because you should probably present in your summary of costs uh, an average as opposed to your low 62 student estimate also. Or somehow or other make that into a range also if the student population is presented as a range. Thank you. Chair. One of the problems we've had all along, Mark, though, is, is Chair. identifying Chair. student population Chair. for specific Chair. neighborhoods. Chair. And we ended up having to go. What, one of the, the, the biggest problem that, that the applicant has had is, is the school department is unable to generate numbers of student by location. The the only way, apparently, in in the town of Falmouth, they they have their enrollments computerized, and there's there's two problems. One, uh, there are certain restrictions on how much on information that you can release, and the school, school school department is naturally reticent to generate information because they don't want to cross that line. Uh, but the second problem is we we do not have the same computerization here in Cape Elizabeth, so it's it's impossible. Unless you went into the entire enrollment, and uh, my understanding is the school department will not let the applicant do that, and went through every single enrolled child and checked the address. Uh, the, the only way we could think of getting at this information was to figure out how many children are picked up by the school bus, because they do have some information on, on routes. <coughs> but otherwise, to figure out how many children are in Broad Cove uh, you would have to go through the enrollments one by one, and uh, I, I, you know, I, I understand what you're asking the applicant. I, I guess I just felt that I needed to make sure you understood that I've already heard from the school department that this is an awful burden to ask them to try to get through this, and there's there's almost no way they're going to do it anytime soon, <coughs> uh, and that the only way we've been able to get at this kind of locational information, other than you know, town-wide information about what enrollments are, is to try to go in the back door by using the school bus routes. 
So it, are, is just to take Broad Cove as an example, is there a route that is Broad Cove plus, or is there a route that is only yes. Broad Cove? Yeah, we, we could probably <coughs> get information on the number of students that ride the bus in the Broad Cove neighborhood. And, and I, I feel fairly confident that we could get a good handle on that. Uh, but again, the applicant's going to be subject to, to two claims. One, that in Cape Elizabeth, there's a much higher proportion of students that do not take the bus that go to school. Um, so you, you, you know, you, you have to figure that even if you get that number, um, we don't have a real strong handle on how far off it is. There's a lot of people that, that pick up and drop off their children. And I think the board will remember that when we were reviewing the school and we were talking about pick up and drop, right. drop offs and separating that for parents versus the school buses. Um, and then the, the second problem is that you know, we'll, be, we'll be using um, numbers from the school buses and, and that probably has a little bit of vary in itself. Mm -hmm. um, well, through the chair, uh, again, the forest for the trees issue uh, aside, uh, the school does issue a, a directory for each, I believe, school that has a student's name and parents, but I believe that it's not necessarily so that all students' names are in that directory. There may be parents who opt not to have their children's uh, names listed. That, again, would be uh, fairly time-consuming, but perhaps one of the easiest ways to get to at least a, a certain neighborhood. Well, uh, and I'd like to also clarify for the applicant. I mean, in, in all fairness, my interest is in seeing if we can come up with, if, if there's, out of all the knowledge that been gain, that's been gained, if there's something that is sort of closer to, to being something that's a, sort of a, a snapshot of the town at this time uh, in an objective sense, uh, given the fact that between Stonegate and Elizabeth Farms, uh, we have uh, an acknowledged low count uh, that, that because it's only based on school busing targets the number at 70 to then use 67 in the study because of other national studies and whatnot that have been done doesn't seem to hone in on that accurate picture. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I don't think it's the position of this board to act like what we've seen for recent publicity coming out of the town of Falmouth that uh, New families have to have, uh, you know, pay their weight in order to live in the town, and not, and, and that's the sole standard of being used of whether or not they should be allowed to build. Uh, I think we just want to see a representation of what this will do to the town over the next few years, and it certainly looks like, uh, in terms of the uh, thoroughness of the projections, that. Uh, you know, this is the type of uh, type of information that looks like it works. I guess it back to the to the forest and trees question that Tom asked before. You know, what is going to be done with this information? You know, we've given you a number, we've given you a range, we've drawn conclusions that say that on average over the next eight years we'll be increasing the school enrollment by about half a percent per year. And over the life of the project we'll mm -hmm. be seeing an increase over the current enrollment of about four percent. I don't know statistically how much um, we are raising the number of children per household by you know, a tenth of a point is going to really alter that conclusion. Well, if we have a low of 67 that you're using in the study, and we have figures also presented in the study that range from 55 to 83, and all of those may be low also, are we talking about 4% or 7% or you know, how do we know? Who knows? Yeah, there, there could be five families with 10 children each, or there could be 20 families with no children. Can I just clarify those numbers? Yeah. We did not actually use the number of 67. The lowest number we plugged into any of our formulas was 77. Um, that was, we, we kind of did a, a projection based on each of those studies, and the study from the National Association of Home Buyers would have left us with a projection of 57 school-age children and the uh, numbers from Stonegate and the other um, Elizabeth Farms left us with a projection of 67, but we worked on numbers of 77 to 82. So we did add, um, we, we did try to be uh, conservative in favor of anticipating more children than the statistics showed. Um, so conservative for the town. 
um, because we recognized that that was probably a low figure based on the mm -hmm. fact that Cape has a good reputation in the school system and that it's one of the reasons people want to come here. So we did, um, we did um, work in a higher statistic when we got to working the impact on the schools. So in, in the chart on page 12, which indicates a low student count of 67 and a high of 77, for purposes of the study, just in terms of a best guess, what are, we, what are, what are you using? Okay, that, I, I beg your pardon, on that one we did, but when we were working in the numbers for impact on the schools, we okay. used the number of 77. Uh, 77. Uh, okay. And I think we felt that was, at any time we figured it into, um, into uh, the budget, we, we used the number of 77. The 67 came from the... The, the average of Stonegate and Elizabeth Farms, but adding eight students to that average number to account for students who might be bused or not, will not be driven to school. Okay. The, the other number came from the average of the Falmouth comparisons. Well, if you go to your uh, summary of costs, bottom line executive summary, and add up the school costs, it comes to 402,000, which corresponds back on page 12 to the low student number of 67. That's right. Yeah. Okay. And also in that part chart on page 12, we also show the number for the 77. For the 77. Yes. Right. The difference of 60,000. Any other comments? Uh, anyone who's dealt with schools, either f uh, from either side of the situation, I know Joy certainly has in Yarmouth, and. Uh, uh, certainly the town of Cape Elizabeth has, has been the issue of the bubble going through the systems. Uh, without getting into any further uh, specific detail, I would, I would only suggest that, I guess for the, uh, wondering what the purpose of this is, is several. One would be to see if there's an extraordinary impact on the town and whether or not it's appropriate to negotiate with a developer to deal with that impact, although we don't have anything specifically in the ordinance to advise us. Uh, the other is just for everyone's information, I guess both for the applicant from the standpoint to demonstrate uh, exactly what the projected impact is and whether it is significant or, or typical or insignificant. Uh, and the other is to perhaps alert the school department and, and the town council to uh, plan for future growth in the community. Uh, um, you know, that uh, uh, the comprehensive plan, as it states in the conclusion, has uh, projected 15% uh, growth uh, between the years 1990 and 2000, and that the uh, build-out population will increase the uh, school-age population by approximately 4%. Uh, and that's, that has some budget impacts on the schools. Uh, I think perhaps uh, something that may be worked on in terms of the conclusion is in general, the uh, last one states that it appears that the schools have some capacity to absorb the additional students with some flexibility on the part of the school administrators. Uh, I think the school went through quite a, uh, a chess game in, in expanding the middle school and the primary uh, and the uh, elementary school uh, to deal with the kindergarten issue and moving kindergarten students down to the high school temporarily. and and uh, particularly where the state wasn't assisting with funding, we were looking at how to better utilize the facilities that we have. And I think part of this impact could probably be uh, dealt with in a, in a similar way. You've provided letters from the uh, public works director and the police chief. I think it would be appropriate to, to give the uh, school department, I know they're very busy, but perhaps an opportunity to uh, respond not in specific detail about uh, 12 students in this classroom or that classroom, but in a little more detail than the conclusion, the last uh, item in the conclusion draws. That is that the high school has a certain percentage under capacity, that the middle school <laughs> was designed with some over capacity, and that uh, uh, generally speaking as well as someone can project uh, reasonably uh, eight years into the future, uh, it's anticipated that there'll be either normal growth required in the schools or that uh, through uh, manipulation of the grades within the existing infrastructure, the schools can continue to accommodate the, the projected growth. And I, I think something like that from uh, Connie Goldman's office would be very, very helpful, either from uh, the superintendent or the business manager. M most importantly, what it does is it provides you, the applicant, and the planning board 
uh, the level of, of information necessary so that when all of a sudden in five years the school has an increase in population and every, everyone's wondering why do we have growth areas and why did we ever approve that project, uh, it's easy for the applicant to demonstrate that uh, yes, we did project that growth and yes, it is actually less than what was projected. So if there is significant issues with the schools, perhaps you should look other than, than our particular project. I just think it provides good baseline information uh, and, and helps the uh, planning board and the community continue to understand the impacts of development. We're certainly willing to send a copy of this whole impact statement or just the school portion uh, to the school department mm -hmm. and ask uh, them for the reaction to it. <clears throat> Is that the appropriate way to do this? I mean, should the applicant do that or should the, should the, the town planner do that? <laughs> <laughs> well, believe it or not, the town planner has been in constant communication with the school department. Um, based on what Tom had just said, it, it, I put a big star here, and what I was going to do tomorrow morning is, is speak with the school department and let them know that the planning board has specifically requested that they comment in writing on the proposal. Okay, so that means you will be providing the copy as opposed to the developer? Yeah, I can do that. Any, any other comments on this particular issue? I would just like to add that we did send, um, we've, I've spoken a couple of times with Scott Poulin, the business manager for the schools, and sent him our projected numbers and asked for, um, and I referred, we referred to it in the plan as though we were expecting the information back on the impact of this growth on the school funding subsidy and he was going to send it to the state two or three weeks ago and still has not heard back. I have, I've left a number of messages for him so I'm assuming that he hasn't got it so that the number we did plug in there was 20% which is lower than the current subsidy which we figured was somewhat safe. Um, but we will continue to see if he has um, information again it's speculation at best because as we all know the funding formula could change and probably will change at any time and so we're just kind of giving it a best guess based on today's statistics and probably even if he had the people at the state office work out the numbers based on today's formula there's no guarantee that um, it would be any more accurate because there's a chance that laws may be changed Thank you. Um, it seems to me, sort of wrapping this up, that we need all need a chance to read this some more and have fur further discussion at a later date. Okay. With that, can we go on to phasing? Again, Terry, if you could just give a sort of a brief uh, okay. overview of what you're and planning. Again, I could go back to the impact statement starting on page six that outlines the number of homes in each of the five phases. If you recall early on we had four, uh, three phases at the, one of the latter meetings we passed out a black and white diagram which is a reduction of this diagram here that shows our projected phasing. Um, phase one is essentially uh, the first portion of Dominicus Crossing will be 32 homes in phase one. 28 with new single family homes. Uh, market rate, uh, there'll be one moderate income home with $150,000 range, and then two single family attached units, as we've talked about before, uh, on the property line. And phase one is expected to be built out over a two year period, roughly 16 homes in each phase. Phase two uh, is Lorenzo Lane, that's that existing. Um, pathway, if you recall, to the right of the uh, field above Juan's house. It goes back to 11 house sites. It's in the middle of a very large red pine wood with kind of 11 homes back there. Uh, these are single family homes in the $250,000 to $300,000 range. Uh, we're anticipating this will take one year to complete. Uh, phase three would extend the roadway up to this point right here. Uh, to a, what would essentially be a hammerhead uh, at the corner of Dominica's Crossing and Leighton Road. 
and we'd be looking at nine homes. Uh, again, that same price range, 250 to 300. Uh, phase four is the start of the um, project. It goes out to Sawyer Road, and that continues the loop all the way through to the end of phase three. So at that point, then, uh, we'd be looking at a continuous travel way between uh, Sawyer Road down to Wells Road. Uh, during this phase, I uh, would we'll be looking at 21 market rate homes in the vicinity of 275, and these are using 1996 dollars. One moderate income home at 150, and then the uh, additional pair of zero lot line single family uh, attached homes. Uh, this is uh, a little bit larger phase, 24 units going through about two years. And the last phase of construction are the larger estate size lots, either the ones in the two, three, four acre size. Uh, we have 20 houses up in that uh, phase five. Uh, for estimating purposes, we're looking at 300 to $350,000, again, at this year's uh, valuation. And we're anticipating that this would take between one and two years to complete. So over uh, the whole project, we're looking at, uh, at the, the outset uh, an eight-year build-out phase, and that's what we've used in, in our estimation of impacts. Uh, there was the issue, of course, that uh, came to light relative to uh, providing a secondary means of access uh, down to Wells Road to avoid the problem with uh, maximum length of dead-end road and the number of houses on it. And we've been saying all along that as we built Dominicus Crossing, the road coming in, we would also need to have a secondary point of access. And our um, our statement all along has been, well, since we do have the driveway that goes up on the west side of Juan's existing barn and the apartment above that right here, which was the third point of access that we looked at on the field, uh, we felt that this would be, uh, with some modification, our, our secondary means of access. It's our understanding that the fire department went out there this week, they took a look at it, based upon their recommendation, we'll be doing a minor amount of modification to that access way. It's going to have to be straightened out a little bit, so it probably comes down to Wells Road at more of a, a right angle. It may require a little bit of grading, perhaps a little bit of extra width on it, but that uh, is our plan right now to use that as a secondary means of access. The fire department, uh, again, we heard this secondhand through Maureen, uh, has said that that would meet their criteria for a secondary means of access. Any questions or comments from the board? Yeah, we've had comments, you know, on the four entrances, and now we're creating a second entrance after kind of having a consensus here that we were going to go with number one, the one to the east. And now are we going to have truck traffic using this, or is it just, just for the fire? Just an emergency access. Just fire. for the fire or emergency vehicles, not for any trucking or That's anything correct. like that? correct, yes. Okay. That, that we can even that. put a crash gate up there if that was necessary. But you understand my oh, yes. meeting. <laughs> How well we do. Thank you. Well, it's, it's suitable as an emergency access way in for all those reasons we talked about earlier. And I believe that we, we should be seeing a letter from the fire department relative to their specific concerns. Um, <clears throat> any other questions or comments on phasing? Ms. McKay? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. I'd like to know from the applicant, uh, are you intending to actually complete each of the houses in one phase, as in phase one, before moving on to phase two, or are we going to have some simultaneous construction, possibly? Let me defer that to Peter. He'll be the one who will actually be building the houses. I guess let me say a little bit about the background of my question just to, no, come, come right ahead, just, just to uh, understand that um, we'd like to be thinking about these in um, sort of different scenarios. Hopefully everything will go beautifully as planned and the thing will happen, you know, within the anticipated eight-year period, but I think part of what the planning board has to consider is if something were to happen to arrest development midway, what would the project look like at that point? And that's the purpose of my question. In answer to your question, Jen, you'd probably build most of the houses, but not all. I mean, usually there's a couple lots. Sometimes people buy a lot and will save. I mean, we'll decide to build it later, two, three years down the road. 
and um, but you certainly don't want to go on to the next phase till you're substantially completed. And um, I guess in other neighborhoods we've done, we usually have two, three lots that uh, that weren't built upon as we went to the next one. And certainly you want to get the next one started before you're finished so that you you don't have that lag time really, especially if you're in a strong market. But if it was to be arrested in the middle or if you got some catastrophic 1990 uh, interest rate sort of thing again or, or a recession rather, um, you, you probably have a few lots that would be um, it would still be vacancy, and usually they stay green, so it's not. Some some people like it better, frankly. Will Will there be other builders besides Nastas and Lonas who are in this project, or will it all be? No. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other comments, questions? Yeah. Um, the, the issue of phasing, again, is the best estimate of uh, projecting market conditions. I can fully expect a situation where nothing sells except for these state lots. Uh, and then it's a mad dash to get the road up to the top of the hill, uh, right. particularly in Cape Elizabeth. I, you know, if, uh, well, it speaks for itself. I guess the uh, concern I would have is uh, uh, a long uh, build out in the first couple of phases. It's already uh, at four years uh, as projected. And that it would seem appropriate that uh, for construction access purposes that, uh, um, you know, you, you begin, uh, you know, uh, rough grading and, and uh, uh, site prep on one section of the access road uh, prior to the completion of phase two, that uh, to a certain extent it may be uh, possible to have gravel access road for uh, construction vehicles, uh, particularly if the phasing starts going differently, if there's a big demand to get up on top of the hill. Uh, I would... Uh, hope that uh, the people along Wells Road aren't the only source of, uh, you know, aren't the only abutters affected by the uh, construction traffic over, over four years, if not uh, longer. How far, uh, Terry, does, uh, with that uh, second emergency access, how far into the site can you go without uh, running into the dead end uh, issue on the, of the road? goes to uh, this point right here, 2,000 feet. Oh, yeah. Measured from this point right here. From the emergency access. Yes. No, yeah. Measured from the, from the fork. At yes. The, yeah. At that point, then, you have the two ways out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to a public street? Is it a public street? To a second means of access. To a second means of access. So there's 20 houses from the northern point of Alicia Circle up to the point where the phase ends. Yeah, you, you could not physically start that and go up this way if you didn't have your other means going out there, Tom. You could, of course, but <laughs> not, not legally. I, I think it would be one of the great marketing uh, conundrums of uh, recent time. Uh, you know, if, if, if I were... have to buy one of these to get one of these? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the second home down on the hill. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> no other questions. Anything else? <clears throat> Let's move on to open space plan. Um, And again, could you give a brief summary of what uh, what we saw when we were out on the um, site walk, as far as trails and that sort of thing? Oh. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. I said I didn't have anything further on that. I don't have anything further particularly on phasing, but this seems to, um, to fit into the phasing, and that is I noticed in our packet this time that we had uh, copies of two letters from John Bannon, one dated April the 4th, and then one dated May the 9th, which was addressed to Mike Hill and to Maureen. And I wondered whether, have we asked Mike to respond to the May 9th letter, or what's the story on that? Mike, Mike obviously got a copy, um, and the applicant asked me what we were doing, and I told him that uh, I would wait for the board's instructions. So if, if the board would like 
a written response from our attorney regarding that letter, I can request it. I would be interested in it. I think we, I, I know that we addressed this issue the last time around, but the uh, the abutter's attorney has taken the time to write and to write what appears to be a thoughtful letter, and I would appreciate uh, having a response. Is everyone sort of in agreement on that, that they would all like to see you respond? Okay. Open space. Brief summary of what we saw on the site walk and what the pathways, trails, etc. Most of us were on both site walks. Some of us could not make the second site walk. Um, and again, we'll extend our invitation if somebody wants to go see a part of the site that you have not seen before, either on the site walks or just in general, we'll be glad to go out there with you. Uh, last Thursday, Amy Bell from our office and Juan met with the Conservation Commission to talk specifically about open space and maybe more specifically about the trail system. And one of the specific things was asked for uh, on Maureen's uh, memo was uh, how the open space network incorporates the trail system into it. One of the things we tried to point out when we walked out on the site on both occasions was where the trails were right now, what conditions they were in, where we need to upgrade them, where we need to cross wetlands, cross streams, and so forth. There's also quite a bit of discussion about who specifically is going to be, specifically is going to be constructing the trails uh, and the criteria that would be used in uh, establishing the trail system. Uh, the diagram that you see right here has a lot of notes on it, uh, which we're using as a way to get a handle on the, the number, the magnitude, the extent of the trails. Um, I don't want to go into all the detail of it right now, but uh, suffice it to say there are a lot of existing trails that are out there. For example, this one of the northernmost part of the site that will be preserved as part of the common open space that will not be disturbed by any development activity. That's one category of trail. Another category of trail um, might be represented by the CMP line, and these are trails that uh, are existing. A lot of people use them, especially people on mountain bikes, uh, people on cross-country skiing. Uh, however, in some places they are particularly in the best location. As we all know from the last episode out there, require a little bit of navigating to get around. Um, in those situations, uh, I think that we'll be looking at places where those trails will be relocated to get them out of the wetlands. It may require uh, some measures, perhaps going, uh, bringing the trails out into the common open space to avoid these wet areas. Um, but that's the second category of, of trail and trail improvement. Um, another category is the establishment of new trails. Again, we're showing on the plan a series of trails that ring the, the upper portion of the site. And again, Juan has made some initial contacts with Troop 30 of the Boy Scouts. Of course, we're one of the abutters over here. And we are starting to work out some agreements whereby they would be working with the developer, Dominicus Crossing, to lay out the trails uh, and to do whatever minimal uh, activity is necessary, primarily clearing of brush and vegetation to make these usable trails. There are going to be places, however, where we do have to cross wetlands. Uh, for example, the upper reaches of Jordan Pond. And the intention here is for Dominicus Crossing to install probably a boardwalk. In fact, we had shown you uh, a screw type of support system to support boardwalks, which are starting to be used more and more in the northeastern United States. Um, that's the intention in these sort of situations. It's not our intent to make this a graveled or certainly a paved way throughout these upper areas, but merely to, to establish a pathway where people can cross country ski. Uh, and as, as the, the use gets uh, more, uh, more popular, become a more well-defined trail. Uh, we don't have any formal agreement with the Boy Scouts right now. There has been a lot of discussion. As I pointed out, in a similar project that uh, we did in, in Yarmouth, uh, there was a group of Boy Scouts that took a project like this on as a requirement as part of their Eagle Scout badge and produced a fantastic trail system. One thing that the Conservation Commission expressed very strongly with us last Thursday was that they didn't want the Boy Scouts to go out there and start laying out trails willy-nilly. They wanted to work with us 
uh, to make sure that the trails, first of all, on our property, but also we're respectful of the existing vegetation, respectful um, of the, the wildlife habitat, the wetlands that are out there, and make it a very interesting trail. At the same time, connecting the trail up in a logical way to specific points. The existing trails up here are making sure there is a loop that continues on. So when we say the Boy Scouts will be helping us with it, uh, don't think of this as being a bunch of amateurs going out with machetes. This will be a, a very well supervised operation uh, that will follow the plan as we're showing right here. Uh, we have notes that are, sh that are on this plan that say that the locations that are shown on here uh, are approximate. Uh, Obviously, we don't know where every big rock outcrop and tree is, but generally, they will follow uh, the, the 100 or 75 foot strip right here. There's a lot of room to play with up here. There are a lot of areas that are much more constrained. Uh, the end result, I think, will be a, a very spectacular trail system that, that goes throughout the development. On top of that, of course, there's the sidewalk system, about two miles of sidewalks, and those certainly speak for themselves. There are a couple of other places, for example, at the end of Lorenzo Lane, there is a very wonderful existing uh, trail that goes through the pine woods. It'll have to be relocated slightly, uh, but there will be that connection that uh, goes from the end of Lorenzo Lane over to the, uh, the other trail network. So that, in a nutshell, is how we intend to uh, deal with the trails. Uh, we should also talk further about the signage for the trails. Uh, it's my understanding there is a standardized sign that the uh, the town uses, uh, and we'll be uh, working with the Conservation Commission to employ those signs at regular intervals throughout here. Comments, questions? No questions on the trails. Okay. Okay. Uh, financial and technical capability. Before you go into that, there are also uh, uh, areas, common areas that had de been designated or discussed on the site walk. Could you point those out as well? Well, Nick overlooked areas. Of the 205 acres, 100 acres more or less are going to be common open space. We have designated cer certain areas, for example, uh, this one right here, uh, which will be set aside as a uh, neighborhood picnic area. It's on a high bluff that looks out uh, to a drop off in a ravine right there. There are other places. Uh, that we're pointing out as potential uh, for some court games. I don't think we actually walked out onto one of those when we were out on the second sidewalk, but it's a relatively level area. It's within the, uh, the wetland setback. It's about 275 feet from the edge of the, the wetland at that point. It does allow the town at some future point uh, to develop it as a small uh, either uh, court area, uh, like half court basketball or playground area. In addition to that, of course, there is the, uh, the large common green down in phase one. There's also the, the green and the eyebrow that we walked around uh, the other day that we built as part of phase four. Thank you. What's that? What's that? Okay, financial and technical capability. Uh, we do have a draft of a letter uh, that came to us. Um, let me just read it to you. Uh, this letter will confirm that should the agreement between Anastas and Lonis and Dominicus Crossing be terminated, Anastas and Lonis will notify the town of Cape Elizabeth prior to any such termination. I believe that's uh, approximately the wording that we had talked about before. If you like copies, I do have copies for everybody here. It's still in draft form. I believe we received a... I agree with myself fixed communication. I gave them a letter for myself saying exactly the same thing. The attorney wrote that. Obviously, I could be attorney if I wanted to, so <laughs> anyway. Thank you. Yeah, okay. thank you. I guess the question is, do we want any kind of uh, time period prior to the, uh, it, do we want at least 30 days notice or I haven't? The letter that I just read has 10 days. I just think that would be. <clears throat> it would seem appropriate to refer that matter to the uh, town manager and that uh, he has historically dealt with issues of uh, performance guarantees and uh, having uh, the review 
sitting with, with applicants and reviewing uh, personal financial statements and so forth that they are not public knowledge. Uh, and has also dealt with issues with respect to uh, projects uh, where a bond has, has been called uh, so that we can get some idea about the notice requirement uh, in order to have the town have sufficient time for the council to be aware and to respond uh, appropriately. Ten days sounds very brief to me. I yes, don't know. Yes, I agree. Well, Thirty days or something like that is... Well, you say in the letter that they will notify the town within ten days if the partnership is uh, dissolved. I mean, if it's in dissolved, this case, the sooner the better. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, the last uh, item in the memorandum is revised drawings. Okay. This is an area which I would really like to get into some serious discussion tonight. As you know, when we submitted our preliminary subdivision application, BH2M, our engineers, um, looked at the ordinance requirements. They completed what were probably 75% working drawings and laying out all the roads, all the lots, the sidewalks, the drainage facilities, stormwater management facilities, and so forth. Uh, and over the course of the review from Fred Morin uh, at TY Lynn, um, we found a lot of places where uh, the standards uh, could be upgraded uh, and he gave us a very le lengthy and detailed letter of uh, improvements to be made. Uh, they were very helpful and I think in the long run it will produce a much better project. Uh, as you recall, as we went through this, we heard comments from the board, we heard comments from Central Maine Power Company, we heard comments from the butters all of which caused us to make a number of fairly substantial changes, uh, reducing the length of the road, of course, uh, two dead-end roads going into a loop, and so forth. Uh, the end result is uh, why the, the basic layout uh, remains the same. The basic concept has remained unchanged. There are a number of areas where uh, some tweaks have been made, uh, some reductions have been made. We've lost one of the eyebrows. Um, so the set of working drawings that you have, uh, the preliminary application as it were, uh, is really no longer uh, the application that's, that we feel is going to be made or is part of uh, the project that you're reviewing right now. However, um, we need to have some discussion as to what it is that we need at this point that will satisfy your needs for a preliminary subdivision application. We've already given you an application. We are showing you in sketch form a fair amount of detail um, how the final subdivision application package that you will get um, after we've gone through the, the DEP process will look. Uh, the same level of detail that we've uh, given you before will be expended in developing all those facility diagrams for the roads, the parking, uh, and so forth uh, for the development. Uh, we would like to think that uh, the sketches that we've given you uh, the amount of detail that's, uh, that's been supplied so far uh, is sufficient to meet the spirit of the ordinance uh, and that the, the preliminary subdivision application uh, should be uh, considered complete based upon the information we've given you appended by this diagram right here uh, and the other material that we've given you over the last several months. Mr. Chairman, I, I think there's uh, two separate issues here. One is the uh, legal basis or, or to uh, protect standing before the board, uh, purely from a legal uh, standpoint, dependent upon any, uh, any action that might, might happen, whether it's a moratorium or a butter's uh, uh, lawsuit for completeness issues. But all of that aside, um, I would think that a, uh, a document that demonstrates the design intent so that it can be clearly shown in the public record that the planning board voted uh, either for or against an application at preliminary approval based on sound information. Uh, and what, what I mean by design intent, something that would show where the roads indeed are proposed to go. Uh, that's fairly, probably with computers now, it's just as easy to do on a computer as it is to do by hand. But 
uh, along with that would be uh, some engineers prefer to do profiles, uh, I think a, a plan view grading plan with a two foot contour interval that you have is certainly sufficient uh, to give us the design intent and to show such things that a road isn't too close to a stream that the fill requirements wouldn't impact this, this, the stream or wouldn't adversely impact the uh, stand of trees so that there's greater clearing required uh, along an, a budding property line, for example. And that can be, again, uh, preliminary grading. It doesn't have to be the finely toured, uh, tuned construction drawings from, from my uh, opinion. What I would call uh, schematic design to design development level drawings from a technical standpoint. <clears throat> Mr. Wilcox? Um, I think my thoughts are probably fairly consistent with Tom's. What we have at this point are 11 by 17 reductions of the colored plan. You can't really see where property lines are. Uh, we, we sort of know where the roads are changing to, but I, I don't see any real need for final stormwater calculations or anything like that, but just a plan that shows hard line where all the lots are and where all the roads are. You'll be getting all the information as part of the final something package. Something that we would yes. need for preliminary subdivision yes. approval to know what the subdivision is of the land. Yeah, it's how it's divided, where the lot lines are. That's, that's. That certainly seems like a, a reasonable approach given the amount of information that's already on file. And there's, and there's information that obviously you need to uh, confirm to yourselves. Uh, uh, as part of our application to DEP, we're going to have to do, you know, for example, all the calculations for wetland crossings. But the, the grading plan approach, I think, will certainly satisfy their concern as well as the concern of the town at this point. Yeah. Terry, Terry can, the, can the grading plan target where the detention basins are located? without having to do detailed yes. engineering yes. studies of them and all of that? I would think that the detention basins Is themselves are not going to be radically altered. Okay. The Woodlot Alternatives has revised the function and value assessment report on the wetlands for the DEP application. Um, we can also submit that. It's been revised to reflect this form of the scheme here. So we can submit that information as well as for the wetland alternative. Yes. Would, would the board want that now, or would you find it more useful as part of the final subdivision application? Yeah, I'd later would be because fine. Because they, they could be submitting it to you now. Um, the reality is that once they make their application to DEP, DEP could be asking for changes. You may get the whole thing all over again as part of the final, sub, final s approval submission. Mm -hmm. I think final would be later on that. But, mm -hmm. Final would be okay on that. But I would echo what uh, Tom and Mark have suggested with respect to the to the plans. N not trying to ask you to do a tremendous amount more than yeah. what any other app. I, I think that's do. a good middle course. At what point in time, um, there seems to be, at least in my mind, some unresolved issues that we've been bringing up as the project has been progressing through to the point where it's at now. And is it more realistic to um, have those discussions later rather than sooner, such as lot sizes and stuff? That's some of the things that I, I feel that we haven't really given a fi any sort of final answer or any sort of um, real final input to the developer on? No, I, I think I, I'm glad you brought that, that issue up. That was something that was requested very early on in the, in the project. I think in response to the whole issue of cluster zoning where, we, where the uh, lot size is very much up to the applicant uh, uh, to demonstrate to the board and to the applicant that the lots that you have selected, the dimensions that you've selected in, in uh, a, some prototypical location, so to speak, are going to meet the uh, market demands uh, for development of the site. Um, there, there have been some lots developed, for instance, in Stonegate that uh, uh, have been very tight. And, and I've had co heard comments from people uh, 
in the development that wished that uh, either something had been configured differently or that houses had been oriented differently. And uh, I think it's important, again, because it is cluster development, that the board see uh, lot layouts with, you know, obviously the, the house is going to be different than probably what you're going to show us, but the, the program isn't going to be very different for a $275,000. <coughs> $350,000 mark, and I think Peter knows very well what those people are looking for. They're looking for a very large garage. They're looking for a turnaround area that's going to have a basketball hoop in some cases. Other cases would never have anything like that. Might even have a, a circular drop-off out front, uh, would have a sense of privacy from the abutters. And I think those are, are things that, uh, particularly in the uh, second phase where you're very close to abutting property to um, to present to the board for both your information, our information, and the public's information that these lot sizes that you're proposing will work for you as well as for uh, uh, the market. Early on, we had talked about um, showing prototypical lots. Mm -hmm. now, I don't think it's necessary to show a grading plan or layout plan for the houses where they're all fairly similar. But in some of these tight areas, for example, I'd probably if we were to show um, you know, the setbacks on front, rear, and side, uh, typical house side, typical driveway locations, would that be sufficient then? Um, yeah, uh, if you selected a couple of the, uh, the areas that have been expressed as concerns, the area that we looked at in the site with the turnaround in it, uh, and then and, uh, 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 you must have some sort of average lot configurations, narrower and deeper or wider and shallow within certain, particularly that run right along the face, uh, that are facing the main access road. Uh, and just demonstrate that, yes, you can get a driveway in there and you can turn around uh, a couple of vehicles and park them in the, in the driveway and that uh, there is a front lawn that people want and there's a nice... When uh, we did the initial layout, you know, we worked with Peter and uh, some of his builders who gave us a minimal envelope that mm -hmm. they felt were necessary to meet the market demand. So mm -hmm. I think that will be fairly easy just to yep. show that. There are, of course, a couple of, air, a couple of lots where we may have to look at wetland crossings or what we'd have to do to avoid those crossings, and we'll, we'll show those also. Those will, be, those will be required as part of the wetlands permitting. <clears throat> Does anyone else have anything to do? I, I just want to, excuse me, Mr. Chair, to, to make sure that at some point I would be interested in seeing the building envelopes for the the, the proposed building envelopes, but obviously we need to get the lot lines. Uh, the lot lines will be shown as well as all the setbacks. The building envelopes. They're, they're, okay. on, they're shown on all the drawings. Okay. okay. <clears throat> Any further comments? Questions, whatever. We have a motion. Mr. Chair. Motion for the board to consider, be it ordered, that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Dominicus Crossing Limited Liability Company for preliminary subdivision review and a wetlands alteration permit for Dominicus Crossing, a 97 plus lot subdivision located off Wells Road and Sawyer Road, be tabled with the consent of the applicant to the regular June 18, 1996 meeting of the Planning Board. Second. All those in favor? Please raise your right hand. I take it we have the consent of the applicant. We didn't ask. <laughs> we, we would like to have all this information that you've requested tonight back in time for review at that meeting. Um, is it unrealistic to, to have a discussion that may ultimately lead to a preliminary subdivision approval at that, at that time? At the next meeting? Why is everyone looking at me? Chair, the I'm, I can't speak for the board. I, how does the board feel? I mean, are we progressing rapidly enough so the next meeting we could anticipate that? I'm certainly willing to try. I, yeah. I guess we a lot of it We are certainly willing to do our ahead. best. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If there's any other issues, please speak now. But we want to try and wrap this up as quickly as possible. I think you've had a fairly affirmative nod of the heads from the board. So. Did you have anything else, excuse me, Steve, on your list of uh, items that we haven't that we've been holding in abeyance and have not discussed? The lot size was the big thing for me. I'm still, I still have 
great reservations about the size of the lots there. But that may have something to do with what I do for a living. <clears throat> Would it help if we were to, again, show photographs of similar situations with similar width lots with similar size houses on them? I'm sure it would be helpful. I think dimensions on you know some selected lots that were would obviously be representative of the different phases would be. I, I know helpful. that your concern, Steve, was this phase down in here. Yeah. Okay, we'll we'll try and do that then for the next. Steve, is your concern the marketability of those? <coughs> marketability and the and livability. Um, yeah. I have a feeling that I really have a serious reservation they're going to be too tight. And I've seen that happen in too many neighborhoods where people. It look, you know, they go into a neighborhood and it looks great to begin with, and then all of a sudden it gets built out. The trees start getting killed from construction, right. whatever. And I know you're going to be planting trees, but I still am very, very wary of just the tightness of the lots. The lots are not big lots. Right. The houses I, are not going to be small houses. Okay, as I understood it, our um, charge or our what we were asked to do was to try to make this more unique, not exactly the same as, as in some other neighborhoods that may have been uh, built in the 80s. That was the idea to try to get smaller lots in some parts, larger lots in the other, and try to get a blend of neighborhoods throughout. Um, we have built a number of neighborhoods with smaller lots in similar towns. Yarmouth, um, even though it wasn't our development, Village Brook um, is one where a um, very successful neighborhood after the um, it was opened up to let uh, other builders buy that because it was a, at the time there was it was an 80s sort of thing there with some problems. But those lots, um, that's you couldn't. Get, it was very difficult to get into that neighborhood after after a time. And those lots were, I believe, Terry, smaller or s the same size as a lot of these. And we could show you pictures of that. Oh, I, I know the neighborhood well. That's right. That's of course you would. Right. Of course you would. I, I myself personally find that too tight. Okay, once again, we were trying to make different, as we came in at the beginning, we were asked to make different types of neighborhood, not the same block, one acre, two acre lots through one. We tried to make some parts with smaller lots and some with larger lots that reflected some successful neighborhoods throughout the area. So in any case, we'll, um, you know, we'll bring in uh, plans that show how they would fit on those lots. Great. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. See you next month. <laughs> well. anyone has any discomfort level, if you will, um, I'd be happy to stand down. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the first part of that. Statement. Mr. Tinsman, the applicant, is selling one of my listings at this point on a COPA basis as a real estate broker. And if anyone feels uncomfortable with that, I'm more than happy to go sit in the audience while you consider this particular item. I don't feel it has any influence on me whatsoever, but if anyone else does, by all means, let me know. It's been a while since I've looked at the conflict provision. Maureen, do you have a recommendation on how it would apply? Excuse me, I, I didn't hear that. I said it's been a while since I've looked at the conflict provisions. Do you have a recommendation on how it would apply. Our, the, the town's policy is a, a conservative policy where the, the opinion is that if there is a conflict or if there is even an appearance of a conflict, uh, the town usually en encourages uh, boards to take a conservative approach and step down if there's the possibility that there's financial gain to be 
had from uh, uh, an interaction with a potential applicant, uh, that's usually been a reason to, to stand down. Uh, Mr. Parkhurst told me about this, and uh, I, I advised him that he, I asked him if he felt that it would influence his decision. He said it would not. I advised him that he should bring it to the board and that the board could make a decision on whether or not they were comfortable having him participate or whether he would not participate on this project. There's, there's enough people here to continue the review with or without Mr. Parkhurst. Um, The way our rules state, uh, a, a member can voluntarily step down or um, they can leave it up to the board. In all fairness to Mr. Parkhurst, I think maybe he should step down. Not, I'm not saying he wouldn't be fair, but that would re remove any doubt that that might come up later. And I think that might be the best course. That's my, my, my personal opinion. I'm comfortable for you to I stay. It's but, yeah. wise to avoid any appearance of possible, possible. Does that mean I can go home? <laughs> no, no, no. 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 <laughs> well, get the motion he to can close go home, the meeting. Right? <laughs> I'll, I'll stay. Um, so, Ms. McKay, would you be kind enough? Good evening. I'd like to ask the town planner to uh, give us a slight introduction to this before we uh, hear from the applicant's representative. Okay, I'm going to start by just reading the introduction here. It, this is uh, entitled the Tinsman Public Access Waiver. It's a request by Tom Tinsman for a public access waiver for lot U17-7 located on Ocean Avenue. That's section 1942B public access waiver in the zoning ordinance. Uh, Mr. Tinsman has a, actually I believe it's a series of four lots um, out of a, a very old recorded, legally recorded subdivision. Three of those lots uh, are occupied by his existing residence. The fourth lot is abutting that land, but it is a separate legal lot. It's a little over 10,000 square feet, so it's a buildable lot, although this zone requires a minimum lot size of 80,000 square feet for new lots. Um, the attorney, our town attorney, has checked and determined that this is a buildable lot. Uh, in order to serve it with a septic system, the applicant needed to get a minimum lot size waiver from the state. That waiver has been granted. Um, so what you have before you is a proposal for a public access waiver because Ocean Ave is a gravel private road. There are several existing homes on, on that road right now, um, but because the lot does not have frontage on an accepted town road, a public access waiver is required before a building permit can be obtained. Are there any questions? This sure looks familiar. <laughs> Didn't we review this and approve this about a year ago? Uh, you saw this in a workshop several workshop. months ago. We didn't approve it in a workshop. No, you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> same lot, same everything. Boy, I thought we approved it. <laughs> no, it, it, I'm Jim Hopkinson. Uh, good evening. It had not, uh, at that time, Tom, I do not believe, had his uh, waiver from the state for the uh, lot to be uh, uh, reduced from the state minimum requirements of 20,000 uh, down to the size now, which is 10,421 square feet. Uh, this is, uh, uh, the plan that I have here that I've tacked up is a copy of the subdivision plan from the Registry of Deeds, uh, 1927 plan, and that's uh, the property or the area that's been developed. I've made the plan right side up because uh, that's normally what I do for reading purposes, but the surveyor who put this plan together, that they're uh, just reversed. So we have uh, uh, Bowery Beach Road here and here. And this lot is the lot in question. Right here I have a, a larger scale drawing showing the uh, building envelope, the setbacks, also showing down here the location of the septic system that will be placed upon the lot. And that's the septic system that was approved by the state of Maine on the application. And attached to your materials is that same application. The uh, uh, current Tinsman residence it does sit on three lots. Uh, those are the three lots that are 
labeled here as the remainder of uh, tax map lot 7, uh, which are uh, the three lots here, 22, 24, and 26, on the uh, subdivision plan. Uh, the uh, uh, materials that we have uh, submitted to you under the letterhead of the lawyer and associates, those were the surveyors who put these uh, materials together. They go down uh, the street standards right from your public access uh, waiver requirements under the ordinance and uh, address each of those issues. Uh, those, uh, that package has also been submitted to the town engineer. The town engineer has had a, an opportunity to review and provide a written response to uh, the planning department. Uh, the town engineer raised no objections to uh, the request being uh, made, uh, raised no uh, outstanding issues. Uh, this uh, project has been reviewed by the uh, fire chief. The fire chief uh, has not objected uh, to the request. Uh, primarily the fire chief's uh, uh, decision was based upon the fact that there, uh, there are more than uh, two ways out from this lot because Ocean Avenue does connect with Richmond Terrace and there are two entrances on Bowery Beach Road. <coughs> uh, in addition, uh, one of the uh, uh, requirements under your public access uh, waiver ordinance is that the first 50 feet uh, coming off the uh, public road uh, be paved. You have uh, a memo in the file from your public works director stating that because of the uh, uh, material uh, and the uh, compaction of the material on Ocean Avenue, uh, as far as the Public Works uh, Department is concerned, uh, paving would not be required. Uh, the Ocean Avenue and Richmond Terrace have been in existence uh, almost as long as this plan. Uh, there is a slight grade uh, difference between the requirements under the uh, public access waiver and the, uh, uh, what is actually existing. Uh, we've asked for a waiver on that because of uh, the fact that uh, the road's been in existence for some time. Uh, your engineer has looked at that as well and, and has raised no issues uh, with that. Again, recognizing the fact that Ocean Avenue and Richmond Terrace have been in existence for quite some time. Um, the uh, uh, building envelope that we've shown here does meet the requirements for a lot of this size, uh, being a lot of record. Uh, we meet all the setback requirements and uh, the lot itself uh, meets the uh, uh, width requirements. Uh, and without uh, going really overboard on, a, on what we are trying to look at as a straightforward application, I'll ask the board uh, if they would consider this and uh, approve uh, uh, Tom and Carol, Carolyn Tinsman's request for a public access waiver. Thank you, Mr. Hopkinson. Does any board member have any questions or discussion about this application? How many bedrooms are you planning for the house? The system is designed for three bedrooms. Three bedrooms. No, there's no public sewer in this area at all, is there? No. Was there any consideration for uh, moving the house forward and placing the septic system in the back? There, there is a uh, uh, possible second site in the back. Um, the, uh, uh, that sits right in the uh, rear portion. In looking at Al Fritz's uh, HHE 200 form uh, in the section, uh, it's the last page that has drawings. Uh -huh. uh, he shows uh, the chambers, like the uh, yeah the chambers, and he shows three, and they're 15 feet uh, out to out, uh, and it's 12 inches above uh, uh, proposed 12 inch liner of loamy sand. But what I don't see in that section is the existing grade and any indication as to how long it's going to take to get back to existing grade, whether this is going to look like a, a, a grave mound in the front yard, and if, uh, whether or not there's any uh, uh, vent pipes associated with it. I say that out of, out of concern that uh, there was a septic system constructed on, on uh, Route 77 or, or Spurwink, uh, 
and the septic system was put within 12 feet of the road right of way and it's got a, if I remember correctly, has a vent on it. And just recently one was done down in Scarborough near uh, Pleasant Hill that uh, essentially took out all the trees in the right of way. I don't know how they ever pulled that off, but uh, they did so. Very nice looking house, but it's uh, one of those very unfortunate situations in trying to preserve rural character. Uh, I guess there's nothing more rural than a septic system unless it's a, uh, a cesspit. <laughs> but uh, so the there. mound with the stack pipe in the front lawn is something that uh, I would be concerned of as a, if I were an abutter. Obviously, I'm not, but uh, those are sort of the uh, parameters I think about. Is there any indication as to uh, how much uh, side slope and, and how long it's going to take, before, how close the uh, earthwork will be to the street? No, I don't know uh, the precise uh, answer to that question, uh, to be honest. I can, I can tell you that right now there is a, uh, uh, a row of uh, trub trees uh, approximately my height, right, uh, that are along here that will be staying. So in terms of, of views to the property, uh, that was taken into consideration in, in the fact that it would be located in what would be traditionally the front yard. Mm -hmm. Um, there was actually some concern because some of these neighbors uh, are, are going to very naturally look because of the slope of the land in the back uh, that uh, it would be it would be more visible to them here than over here by the uh, uh, by the trees. And it's safe to assume then that the uh, whatever driveway garage access would be from the left side of the lot as one faces a lot standing in the street? Yes. To miss the uh, septic system? That's correct. And the uh, Mr. Tinsman is the abutting property downstream from the septic system? This property here, yes. Yeah. Stream's not good. <laughs> <laughs> No further questions. You raised some good ones. Mr. Wilcox. I have two questions regarding the septic system. Sure. Uh, the design of the septic system in indicates the rear test pit area as being a potential replacement system location as opposed to being an optional location for the just general siting of the, te of the septic system on the site. Is there... Uh, is there anything which mandates that uh, to be remain unbuilt on uh, during the course of development so that it is available as a replacement location? It given would. The soils or yes, soils? it would actually be uh, back in, in the portion that's outside of where the building envelope would be, so uh, it wouldn't be able to be built on. It that would still be uh, available. Would that be that similar one in the front where it's 10 feet from the property line and then about 15 feet in depth? That's correct. Sort of thing. Okay. Uh, my second question is, are there wells in the neighborhood? Or is everybody yeah. on public water? It's public water. Very good. Thank you. Any further questions or discussion? Has there been any, uh, any uh, correspondence or, or any contact from abutters with respect to this application? I know there's no public uh, meeting no. Uh, required. There's no public hearing required. I've, uh, there, were, there was a lot of interest at the workshop. Uh, we did mail out another set of notices last week, and I had one uh, neighbor who called uh, basically just to find out what was going on. Uh, there was another neighbor who came in, and unfortunately that neighbor is the person immediately uh, west of the property and has some serious concerns about uh, the view and how it's going to be diminished by a house immediately next door. Uh, I advised that person that uh, the board didn't really have any authority to talk about views and encouraged him to speak with Mr. Tinsman and that perhaps um, you could come to a private agreement about uh, the extent of the, the structure that's going to be put on that lot, perhaps preserve some of the view of the neighbor next door. Any further discussion? No, I, I um, uh, not to drag this out, but uh, 
currently I believe that uh, the minimum lot size for a septic system is 40,000 square feet. Is that correct? 20. Still 20,000. 20? Okay. So you're, you're asking for a 50 percent reduction in the minimum standard? And, and the state has granted that? Yeah. Was there any discussion about a, a septic easement onto the what will be the abutting property to make up for um, uh, this, yeah. the, the, the Tinsman abutting property? Yes. Uh, I don't think once once this is actually where the grade uh, starts to change, and uh, I'm not sure that there is sufficient room. There is in your package, just so you can look at that. It's. This, this page in your package does show the uh, location of the house and garage on the, uh, what, we're, what we would call the remaining property and shows where the uh, boundary line would be for the plan. The, uh, uh, the, the plan that uh, uh, attachment two? Uh, this is attachment one. Yeah. Okay. Attachment two seems to imply with that arrow that that's uh, one lot owned by the same party. But not one contiguous lot. Correct. Okay. Again, just for the record and, and for anyone who might be in the audience or watching on TV, TV what we're talking about is an existing uh, lot, not, uh, a sep not a uh, resubdivision. That's okay. No, we're not in the shoreland setback. No, I'd note that the frontage on the lot is 80 feet. And as shown on page 2 of the HHE, or page 3, I guess, of the HHE 200, it looks like the longitudinal part of the system would be about 38 feet. Uh, just I'm wondering whether with the the feathering and the proposed slope that that will have enough room to uh, to feather out but I presume that uh, mr. Frick has done his homework I know I know that he did uh, because there, there was the discussion about the location of the driveway in particular so we we knew that that would be okay uh, as well as the uh, uh, he, he did not feel that there would be a need for any uh, easement to be retained uh, from the abutting property, but unfortunately, I just didn't have the precise uh, slope and, and measurements for that. Any further? Uh, from what I can make of the HHE 200, uh, the system, at least on the driveway end, is flush with grade. Uh, he has elevations targeted on that end of the system as being 38 inches below his elevation reference and on his detail through the system he indicates the grade on top of the system at being 38 inches uh -huh. below his reference so I think he's digging this one down into the ground at least on that end of the system it might rise up out as it travels toward the Tinsman's house that's kind of that's right hard to tell but not too much Thank you. Anything else? Uh, uh, lots of this size are uh, particularly challenging from a, from a development standpoint. I mean, they can be uh, the tighter things get. Sometimes the better the solutions can be, and alternatively, uh, sometimes the the uh, tighter things get, the more. Um, and sensitive the solutions can be to abutters. And particularly as an infill development, um, I think there should be concern about impact uh, on abutters with all due respect to uh, the applicant's property rights. Uh, generally, I think uh, from a policy standpoint, for the town to consider placing a septic system in 1996 on a 10,000 square foot lot is very, very poor uh, planning. Um, fact that this lot has been here since 1927 and has been uh, left undeveloped, undeveloped. Usually there's some reason for that, but uh, 
this is not something that I, as a board member, uh, would uh, highly promote. There's certainly nothing wrong with a 10,000 square foot lot on a sewer lot. Um, the neighborhood I live in has roughly 12,000 square foot lots, and they were originally on septic, and they, they are now all sewered uh, for a very good reason. And part of that is, uh, you know, the neighbors complaining about uh, failing septic systems. Um, uh, it's simply it's simply an observation. I mean, if there were a way to do this with public sewer, I would certainly promote it. I think that Tom has he's gotten his uh, his uh, letter from the state. He meets that. Uh, as far as I know, the town uh, code enforcement officer would would uh, submit uh, would approve the HHE 200 form. So there's really nothing here of substance that the planning board uh, uh, can deal with. Uh, there's an existing access road. Uh, it's a neighborhood, certainly, of many houses. So from that standpoint, um, I, I don't have any further issue with the, with the project. I, I, it probably would be great if the entire neighborhood were on public sewer, not just this one lot. Uh, anything further? Do I hear a motion? No, the only other thing is that if you like the view, make sure you own the property that affords the view. That's uh, lesson number one in buying property in the state of Maine. Whether it's a 100-acre field across the street, assume the worst case, it'll be a trailer park. Uh, that's one thing that one hears. Uh, if there's a vacant lot next door and it really is the key to enjoying your lifestyle, uh, uh, the planning board has very little jurisdiction within the uh, building uh, codes of the town, not the building code, but the ordinance of the town of Cape Elizabeth, if it meets a setback and meets a height restriction, uh, with all due respect to any way that a house can be configured to block views and so forth, that's uh, a concern that this board has heard uh, loud and clear from other neighborhoods where uh, infill development has taken place, but uh, buyer beware. Yes, indeed. <coughs> Do I hear a motion, Mr. Wilcox? Mr. Chair, I'd like to offer the following motion for the board to consider. Findings of fact. One, Thomas Tinsman is requesting a public access waiver for a lot of record, being a portion of U17-7 located on Ocean Ave. Two, the applicant has demonstrated that the lot is part of a recorded subdivision and that the state of Maine has granted a waiver of the minimum lot size law and approved a septic system design for the lot. Three, the application substantially complies with the public access waiver standards, section 19-4-4, parentheses B. Therefore, be it ordered that, based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Thomas Tinsman for a public access waiver for a lot located on Ocean Ave, being a portion of U17-7, be granted. Do I hear a second? Second. Uh, Mr. Wilcox, would you accept a reference to the public access waiver standards in your number three to be uh, section 19-4-2B? The town planner has uh, suggested that that's a correction that should be made on the record. Uh, consider my motion so amended. Fair enough, and will acceptable to the second. I, I, I thought presented. that was going to mention it, but. <laughs> Fair enough. Any further discussion? All in favor of the motion, raise your right hand. That's unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you.